All right, welcome to the Duckyard Elixir Roundtable. Um, we uh, have a, a few different topics we're, th we're thinking about talking about today. I'm gonna let Brian take it away with the first one. Okay, all right, so um, for those that may not have seen, I have a PR pending on both Phoenix and Phoenix Live View that essentially rewrite the asset pipeline. Um, this is, uh, I guess I'll add a little bit of a tease here, but this is playing into a bigger picture of something else that I'm working on um, that will be announced at ElixirConf. Um, and it also, I feel like is going to address some of the uh, concerns and issues people have with debugging um, uh, like channels in live view. So the, the, what I ran into was um, that the Webpack configuration itself was uh, essentially built in such a way that both Phoenix and Phoenix Live View were pre-compiling all the assets, minifying um, and optimizing them and then shipping that uh, minified optimized JS as being brought into your own application's asset pipeline. And I keep saying asset pipeline because uh, of Rails, but I don't know if we're having an official term for it in Phoenix land. Is there, Chris, is there like a Phoenix term for it or are we using asset yeah, pipeline? I'm glad you clarified. No, we don't use that term. And okay. I think, yeah, so <laughs> nothing, we're, yeah, saying. So we're, we're not, yeah, we're not introducing an asset pipeline, just okay. uh, the built-in bundled Webpack config Oh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> the built-in yeah, webpack config <laughs> bundled I, yeah. changing. Yeah, so I guess <laughs> yeah, maybe you can you you rewrote the build pipeline for Phoenix and Phoenix Live View um, themselves, and then you also updated the new project, a new Phoenix project generator to use Webpack five and make use of the source maps and, and whatnot that we now generate as part of the Phoenix and Phoenix Live View project. Yeah, so what-, what uh, That's, what, a, I, go, I guess that's a full rounded way to, to phrase it. So you did more We gotta come up with an acronym. Reworking. What, can we yeah. acronize that? Uh, Webpack W, oh, you can't make the, all right, never mind. We're not gonna come up with an acronym right now. It's just the JavaScript crap. Let's just call it the JavaScript crap. <laughs> I'll call it that. Um, sorry, JavaScript people. Um, but the uh, the issues that um, I was having during developing uh, Phoenix Live View application was if I wanted to go into the guts of the JavaScript and see what was going on, because it was minified, setting debugger points was essentially useless. Um, and uh, because we were taking in the uh, already minified and optimized JS code, uh, we couldn't really source map it because there was nothing, there was no original source to map it from. Um, there were source map uh, configuration options set, but they, going back through some of the previous PRs to see the history of it, uh, they were, it's, I mean, this is where we're gonna start to get into like some of the complaints around JavaScript, is that uh, it, it's like, allows you to do everything. And that, um, especially I think what's nice around Elixir and uh, like opinionated technologies, is that you know, here's your lane that you stay in and then you don't have to think about all the other stuff around it. And then in JavaScript world, it's like, okay, like here is uh, the JavaScript runtime, your browser, figure it out. And so now you're given with like every single possible permutation on any way anyone may be want to create a JavaScript application. And Webpack supports all these potential permutations on application uh, organization architecture. So even for source maps, if you look at the source maps configuration, there's about like 12 different types of source maps your application can generate and they have different trade-offs for performance and um, source fidelity and that sort of thing. And so the one that was being used was uh, highly, op highly optimized source maps that essentially did not give you anything useful coming out of them. Um, and the justification for it in the PR was probably a very good one that this particular use case was seeing um, six seconds up to a minute 30 on their build times for the JS with the uh, default kind of like really high fidelity source maps, switching over to the optimized one, you know, switch that out. But kind of the history of the, the Webpack configuration too was 
it started out simple and then it got more complex over time as people kept adding their own needs to it. And then there were um, people not even using Webpack. They're using different uh, JS build uh, build systems like Rollout, Rollup, sorry. Um, Chris has probably heard more of the names than I have. And so some of the, uh, like some of these artifacts on auto configuring these things started to leak into uh, Phoenix. And so what we ended up with was something that um, uh, was uh, presumably out of the box going to help people get going on different options, but also it kind of gave up a lot of things for the paved road path, which is for right now, just a basic web pack configuration. Um, the other thing that I did was I split all the, the single mono file, JS file into ES6 modules um, and did all the ES6 importing around that. That is more of a um, maintenance type thing. Like the, the, the one mono file, uh, it seems like, and Chris, you can correct me, it came about because originally it started small and it's more productive to work in the small file, but it just grew over time. I think that the, the Phoenix uh, JS file was maybe 5,000 lines, something like that, or 1,500 lines. I forget what it was, but live view was smaller, yeah. but it's still like well over 1,000 yeah. lines. 1,500 sounds about right. Yeah, 1,500 yeah. or so. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the goal for live view was I, I didn't want, I didn't want to create a JavaScript framework uh, is why I was trying to keep it all in a single file. And the goal, was, like Phoenix JS, it's only 1,500 lines of code. And honestly, the reason why Phoenix I didn't, I didn't split out is just because I didn't want to deal with um, any kind of build tool. I mean, it, we built with Webpack out of necessity, but it was like, mm -hmm. I just write JavaScript in a single file. I don't have to worry about how that gets concatenated together. And that's where that yeah. started. Um, but yeah, so you did you did uh, the work of splitting. I mean, I think it made sense for for live view for sure. Um, and then Phoenix JS. Assuming that go jump to definition still works in VS Code, then uh, I'm happy. I'll be happy to merge it. But I haven't played with it yet locally. I haven't tried jump to definition. I okay. I, I think it should, but um, I'll have to try the uh, the kind of like the. The things that are left undone right now um, that are more kind of like veneer type things is that the um, uh, the relative path of the J the Phoenix JS uh, ES6 modules and the relative path of the Phoenix Live View ES6 modules are being used as a source map path for the exported JavaScript. Um, and so like when you go to, in the Chrome inspector, if you look at the uh, Webpack uh, source maps listing, you're not gonna see like Phoenix slash channel.js. You're gonna see like dot dot slash JS Phoenix slash. And that's, that's an annotation type thing that I just didn't really dig into and how to fix. Functionally, it's fine. I'd like to get it that last mile to, get rid of that because it just looks a lot nicer and a little bit more polished. But if someone else says, I know how to do that, here you go. That'd be fantastic because digging through the Webpack configuration uh, documentation is like digging through, and I'll bring up Scott's, uh, Scott's not on camera, but Scott's shirt, uh, Apache documentation. <laughs> it's like, it's very punishing going through it. And it's, you know, finding that one thing is very, very difficult. And then also just the, um, I mean, the, the churn that exists in JavaScript world is a bit mind numbing because there's, I mean, there are libraries out there. They're like three years old. that are in version 26, which is nuts. And they're, you know, it's observing Semver throughout all these major version changes. And it's just going through make like massive changes. I, so one of my goals was to reduce the amount of dependencies down to the core essentials. Um, and then Chris and I spoke about, uh, resisting scope creep on uh, you know future additions to the JS side of things, because it's just gonna be more things to potentially have to maintain, but also leaving things in, in such a way that if someone wants to deviate and you know say they do have those very valid um, slow build times, great, just change that one line of code to change out the source maps and now it's speedy. Yeah, when there's a new version of uh, Phoenix and you regenerate the template, you're gonna have a conflict, you know, just choose the right one. But it's it's um, it's better to have the higher fidelity source maps for everybody um, rather than opting into the more performant version 
out of the box and then not allowing them to have an easy way to see what's going on under the hood. Like I, I've been spending a lot of time in the Phoenix Live View uh, Slack channel and it's maybe a few times a week I see people asking about the, J, the JS side of things and then saying like they, they can't step through the code just because of it's shipped. Uh, yeah, to be honest, a, Brian, I, I thought that our source maps uh, worked because yeah. we had we had the option in the webpack config, so I was like, yeah, but we it's, have source it's, maps. No, no, it's no, not no, for no. the J. Yeah, it's yeah. not for the Phoenix Live View now. But the reason why I was convinced it worked because anytime I'm working on Live View or someone reports a bug, I'm always working off of the local ES6 source yeah. that I'm importing. So it's like for me, I like I can always step through the code and like it, I've never I, I've never been running. Um, without the source, if that makes any sense. Uh, so yeah. it's, it's always worked for me. So I just assume that, yeah, we have source maps, but uh, it was news to me. Um, <laughs> and then I wanted to rant about the churn as well, because part of Brian's upgrade to Webpack 5, um, his configuration orphaned all the Webpack, Webpack processes for new Phoenix apps, because they renamed the watch standard in command line oh, yeah. option to watch options standard in. But didn't they do that twice now? Like for yeah, older versions? Yeah, which is the Yeah, so like previously in Phoenix, we had to change that. So the Phoenix new uh, config, dev config generator passes these options. So it's just like, yeah, from Webpack 3 to 4, we had to change that option. And now it changed again from 4 to 5 for the same thing. So like completely arbitrary, unnecessary yeah. churn to rename an option, much like the same name that it was doing the exact same thing. Um, so there's just my rant of, yeah, when Chris brought that up on a on a call with me, he like I was asking him, you know, off the top of your head, are there any uh, like gotchas that may occur? And I happened to bring up that the command line option change for watching. And he said, "Oh, you know, we're essentially watching for was it end of file that you're watching for?" Um, and I I did like a PSAX grep on uh webpack i think i had like 150 webpack processes still running and so the only real solution at that point was probably to restart my computer rather than killing like going through them individually i think i tried kill all and didn't work um so it's just like i don't know i i i kind of i i think i appreciate elixir more i don't want to come off like elixir fanboyish but i, I do i appreciate elixir more after spending, you know, going back in the JavaScript world for a period of time, um, you know, because of the lack of decisions I have to make on these more boilerplate things. Um, and I, I think that these are kind of the uh, values that are built into a language at the start based upon how, you know, the leaders of that, of that language essentially say you know this is the direction we're gonna go and with javascript because it started out you know i don't consider it a toy language now but it definitely started out as a toy language you know kind of grew organically over time and allowed all these other ideas to come into it rather than um uh, it's, Net, it's mozilla now but netscape at the time saying you know this is the way it's going to go um and so i think that just kind of uh really uh gave me a lot of um, appreciation for uh, Elixir's language in an ecosystem. Yeah, and I think to make it to to make it a fair criticism of of Node, I think my my biggest issue is just like the amount of um, bloodshed to maintain Webpack within Phoenix over the last I don't know. It's, Phoenix has been around for like six years. I forget when we switched from Brunch to Webpack. But like an unbelievable amount of effort. Like I, I think Brian can attest to this. I think Brian thought this was going to be a two-day effort. To, <laughs> yeah. To, and it was Is like, it like yeah, a, a two weeks of like maybe a month, work. month and a half. Yeah. And I think it's like we're complaining, but I think that the valid criticism is like the Phoenix team. I don't consider myself a Webpack or JavaScript expert, but I'm you know I've done a ton of JavaScript. Um, the contributors uh, or the Phoenix core team. We have a couple couple people that work in um, JavaScript as much as they do Elixir and are, you know, as just as an expert as any other full-time JavaScript developer. And we still make mistakes with the Webpack config. So we pushed a bad 
Phoenix Live View released recently where we merged like a one line config change to the Webpack config. Someone sent a PR. I actually, I completely forget. Oh, it added uh, to the main package JSON, it just added the module declaration option so it would work with the Snowpack and Vite package managers. And I had um, Gary on the Phoenix Core team who does JavaScript a ton, like for years and years. He's just like just as much of an expert in JavaScript as he is Elixir. And I, I had him review it because I was like, sure, this looks fine. It's one line. And then he reviewed it, said looks good. Uh, and it worked for the Snowpack and Vite folks. And then it built our Webpack bundle just fine. I pushed a Phoenix Live View release and then no one could import um, Phoenix Live View. So I had to push a new release. Uh, so my valid criticism is like, even people that are, I consider experts and what we're doing day in, day out over the X amount of years with Webpack, we still mess it up in arbitrary yeah. ways. Um, and I, to me, it, it's it, there has to be something there. Like, I don't understand, like either, it makes me feel, I guess, incapable um, more than it should, or, or maybe Elixir is just that helpful. Um, but anyway, the metaphorical bloodshed is unbelievable after so many years of actually doing Webpack and thinking we understand it. The yeah the the kind of skill set that I've seen to be very successful in JavaScript land are those that have extremely good recall memory, um, because the uh, uh, just the amount of things that are occurring, um, the amount of moving parts that exist, and then the changes that are constantly happening. Like you said, you can take a like a I feel like a senior engineer can then jump from language to language and be pretty effective because they can bring some of those patterns over. But in JavaScript, it's like, okay, you can have some of the patterns, but you now have to know like this gigantic, constantly moving machine that, that are, that's there. And that becomes a bit overwhelming and a bit daunting at times. I mean, I did JavaScript development full time for the better part of 10 years. Um, I, uh, I did some, I mean, I, I made major contributions back to Ember JS, Ember Data, um, a lot of the Ember stuff. Major contributions back to Broccoli JS, um, like Ember CLI. And if I were to go back to that today, I, I'd I'd be essentially starting from zero. Um, whereas I feel confident that if I don't do Elixir or Phoenix for the next like four or five years, I can come back to it and not have to relearn relearn from scratch. And I think that there's there's major value to that. I think there is something to be said, though, that just because client side application development, especially for the past few years, was this moving target on improving and getting to like, okay, how do we build out a, a UI and distributed like space like web application development that perhaps there was some learning and lessons to be learned and bringing those lessons back. But for me, I just, I mean, if I had to continue as a JavaScript engineer full time, I think you would be like constantly just having to maybe 20% of my time constantly learning on what, like what, what the next thing is, or like the next version of the tools I'm already familiar with. I mean, it's difficult enough as a software engineer staying on top of emerging technologies, but if the technology and language you're, that you're an expert in is churning that much, I mean, that's so much more on top of that. Well, yeah. yeah. And like, you know, client projects too, from, like a lot of them obviously that are using Phoenix have a pretty minimal footprint. And I know one we were working on has a very minimal footprint as possible, as much as possible. And even still we have our build set up to run NPM audit on every build. So every few weeks we get uh, outdated, you know, vulnerability uh, problems. And we got to update our dependencies and that can be a one to two day or more yeah. process. Uh, and so like that's client hours and like their work, you know, spent for us just trying to figure out how to update dependencies. And I know I've been in a place where, I've, okay, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to go to this route and you get blocked and you're like, oh no, you got to update all these other dependencies and make these other changes. Oh, you know what? Ultimately you get to the end, you go, oh, I got to upgrade Webpack. So then that's a whole other clean slate and you got to start all over. So yeah. I don't know, it's uh, it's daunting even, you know, from the most minimal configuration possible on the client side and keep that up to date. And if you don't do NPM uh, audit, you're, you can be in trouble pretty quick. Nathan, I think you have a hand raised. 
Yeah, just to say, like you were talking about having to spend a lot of time staying up to date on, and that's uh, that's why I've basically allowed myself to become a JavaScript dinosaur because I, it's just too tiring. And I like to think about um, th think about the technologies that I've learned. Like there was a time when I did a lot of work in JavaScript. It was a long time ago. <laughs> um, this was back in like the jQuery era, um, but I did a lot of work in it and. Everything that I learned during that period is completely irrelevant now. I mean, other right. than like a very few things about like event bubbling, maybe in the browser is still relevant, but most of that is all gone. And like, but everything that I learned about SQL in 2008 still 100% applies. Yep. So every technology has its, you know, love, sp pace of change and, and everything. And, and I kind of think about like to be employable, I have to have a stockpile of knowledge of a certain size. And so some of that knowledge is like decaying away faster than others. So I'm kind of hesitant to pull into my stock. Like I have limited amount of time to grab stuff and pull it in and it's always decaying. <laughs> and so yeah. I'm kind of he hesitant to grab anything that's going to decay quickly. You know, I'm like, if I could spend time learning about, you know, uh, if I learn something new in Postgres, I'm going to be using that 10 years from now if I'm still working, right? <laughs> but if I learn, if I spend that amount of time learning something new in JavaScript, I'm going to be throwing that away in three months. So it just doesn't make it attractive to me. Yeah, Scott has his hand up. I, I'm glad Scott's speaking up because yes, he's yes, our, he's it's our very one-sided so far. Yeah, I know it's very one-sided. So I want to hear uh, you know Scott's Scott's take on. No, okay. I mean, yeah, you're you're making me uh, question what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> no, I, I I like I would love to be on Elixir project, but I just have never gotten the opportunity. Um, and I'm just thinking about my own skills, right? And and I think I've been finding that a lot of them aren't really like terribly applicable to other companies, right? So for example, um, some of the big main challenges that we've had to really dive deep into in JavaScript land is rendering 8,000 DOM elements, right? And right. Like, a good budget for that is 1,500 DOM elements, right? But not a lot of applications really have to deal with that, right? Yeah. Uh, another one is, uh, let's say your app needs to support RTL, right? Um, that's 200 million users uh, in the world, but not a lot of applications have to support RTL. And getting RTL right is like really hard, right? I mean, um, you may have RTL that mixes with English text, right? And so you can't, like if you have a block of text, you can't, have one part of that block of text aligned right and the other left, right? That's kind of, uh, um, that just doesn't look right. And, you know, an algorithm that uh, processes a block of text, you know, and looks at the specific, um, you know, you compare like uh, that encoding, right? And, and say, is this in, within the range of RTL and uh, text encodings is, or is it LTR? and making that super fast um like those are things that i've luckily had to deal with but like nobody else really needs that you know except for a few big web apps but like what you said you know postgres um kind of the th questions i was asking in the elixir channel right these are like cross-cutting concerns that everyone has to deal with um and 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 then the small like the small day-to-day -day things that everyone has to deal with in JavaScript land, including build tooling and stuff, it just isn't that interesting nor important to me. You know, the interesting important things are, is eight, how do you figure out 8,000 DOM elements? How do you build an RTL? But how many apps need that? They just don't. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that's true. But I mean, I think all of us on every client project are going to have some things that are pretty niche that you're not going to run into again. I mean, uh, I mean, we we heard about, you know, a design for something that's like trying to do ticket reservations at a high scale without losing any. And on the one hand, that's a pretty niche problem that we might not solve again. But on the other hand, there's some general principles there. So like I think the, probably the things that you're doing on your project, even if you don't solve that exact problem again, you're learning kind of, you're gonna have problem solving skills that'll be useful elsewhere from that. Do you, does that make, does it do, you, would you agree with that? Yeah, figuring out how to hit a debugger in Node when you're 
debugging build tool. <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, yeah, they can be useful, but like uh, yeah, finding the problem in some obscure source is is I feel like a constant problem in JavaScript land. Um, yeah, whether that's really that interesting to you or I don't know, it's not interesting to me. I guess. I mean, especially yeah, when you we'll... start. To... Sorry, go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, Scott. Like, as far as like live view, I feel like there could be something there. Like, you know, the... so Scott is on the Phoenix core team and um, is like the sole maintainer of Morph Dom uh, at the moment. So I think, um, I think. <laughs> Whether uh, for better or worse, uh, yeah, Scott has this experience with managing a bunch of uh, DOM nodes. So I think that at least selfishly, from my point of view, for live view, that that that, that is very relevant, especially with um, there have been some people that are doing like an insane amount of live view, live components on a page, like many thousands, and then have complained about performance. And I'm like, well, it's I think you know I, I think our DOM patching is expensive in that we parse a bunch of HTML every time. Uh, but I, I think just at a certain size of DOM nodes, that's just a performance bottleneck in and of itself. So I think that, I think we're gonna have users that clash up against just the DOM itself, but there probably is a lot of, um, not low hanging fruit, but a lot of things we could optimize within Live View as people start trying to build like more and more, I guess, ambitious things with it. And Scott, your, your expertise could be relevant there. So you think that's a relevant, um kind of a uh, problem to solve is is this high like high load you know a high load on the browser with live view that's that is something people are um, haven't figured out a way around with live view yeah I think you know the one that came up recently was like someone was building a JSON JSON visualizer so they you could give it like a JSON blob and it would build out like an editable tree of that JSON data structure in the browser. Um, so it would be like arbitrary thousands of numbers of DOM nodes that, um, so I think part of it was the way that we um, build components, uh, they were running into a bottleneck, but I think the DOM was just so huge that they had their own, like if it was just JavaScript app, it was probably, it probably would be slow, but I think, I think what's relevant is is people do like Phoenix update a pin, like if you're appending a uh, um, feed of resources, I think we, we could very easily get into the many thousands of DOM nodes. And what we don't do today is like we don't cycle out um, in page, um, you know, we, we don't show the current set uh, in within the scroll window, right? And then page out yeah. other DOM nodes. That, so I think that that's the only way to do it actually. Like right. Ember, even Ember struggled this. So Miguel, uh, act, like the select, he has a, I think it's called like power select or something. Um, and so his library will, as they scroll out of the view, remove them, basically set the CSS offset so that the, the, the scroll position doesn't change. So you're not having that many DOM elements that are in the tree at once. And even on Swift, like, so Swift's, uh, you get this out of the box with Swift, but Swift's uh, V scroll, element i believe will do this for you automatically so even in a native environment they still have to deal with that performance hit for many many elements that are just resonant in the tree so if swift is having to do it i don't hold much hope that javascript would be able to get away without doing it yeah so i think that's something eventually i mean we don't have to solve it for people I and mean, it hasn't really come up that often because i think you know, there, there are ways around it in that you could just, you know, your infinite feed eventually needs to um, roll over yourself where you cycle out elements. Um, but I think eventually if we find ourselves with time on our hands or things to solve, or more likely, you know, if we're solving something for a client project where we actually run into this, um, then I think we, we would solve it. So I think that that is a nice to have in the future, but ultimately I think it's something that if we, with enough time on our hands, we will solve. Okay. What when we were thinking about the scalability needs and like how fast something can reasonably paint on the screen with Lumen, our extreme edge case was Ling's car reviews. I think that's the name of the website. If you're unfamiliar with it, it's like the, the worst website on the internet. Um, but it has like, like I think CNN.com had something like 2000, like 
elements in the tree. And then like Ling's car reviews has some like 25,000. And so we were trying to determine like, what is like, if we were going to go down the, cause originally the, the, um, uh, idea that I had around, okay, a web framework and Lumen can look like where we just have a one-to-one -one mapping of a supervisor tree to like a DOM tree, right? So every node in a DOM tree would actually be its own supervisor that would manage all of its child element elements. And um, we, uh, El, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that maybe you had actually figured out like the potential memory consumption of each like process or something like that. And like, it, it seemed like it wasn't reasonable for Ling's car reviews, but for a more common content heavy site like CNN, it was. Or maybe this was like, you did the stress test where you basically instantiated a, a ton of elements. I know. Am I remember correctly? I, I don't remember the, the Ling one. I know just like the DOM table thing is not limited by, by the Lumen runtime. The right. demo where we add to the table, that's just how slow it is for the browser to scroll down, but keep the table resident in memory. And so I agree, it's, it's a limitation of the browser and the way the DOM works. It's not a limitation of what we could do with the Lumen engine, even, you know, back then, like two years ago. So it's, yeah. it's, and it's not the, um, it's not the switching overhead because Firefox had already fixed that by then when we were doing those tests. Okay. So it's, it's all managing the DOM tree. Because yeah. we also saw the same thing with council.log and that is, you know, that is their most efficient way to put up a DOM tree of like, you know, Jason curly races. And that also slowed it down. But yeah. like printing is slow is a known issue. Like when I ran Gen 2 in college, like looking at the builds happening made the build slower because there's the back pressure for IO. Mm -hmm. So Chris does, Live view have uh, API hooks. If like if if you're gonna say like we're not gonna support this use case out of the box because it's like it's too edge case, right? Does Live view have hooks where someone could say, okay, I'm going to write something on top of Live view to support it, or is that yeah, not you could do it? I don't I don't know. I think there are people on the forum that have talked about doing something like this. Um, I I don't remember the specific use case, but yeah, like our our what we do, the way we cheat with Phoenix Update Pin, which allows you to do like infinite scrolling, is we, the server only renders like the last X uh, elements to the page. So as far as the yeah. server is concerned, it's only ever rendering, let's say 10 items. And then on the, when we go to patch the DOM, when, when we are going to insert a child to the parent uh, or remove a child from a parent, what am I trying to say? The, we patch the DOM and the parent node is like, oh, I only have these 10 children now. I need to go remove the 100 that are there. And then we say, are you marked with this special annotation? And if so, we leave the children uh, untouched. So I think uh, as far as the workaround is concerned is you could actually just go discard those DOM nodes yourself uh, out from under us. And then we will be unaware of that. So uh, it wouldn't be very, very difficult today to to start uh, discarding and adding nodes to a, a appended container, but you'd have yeah. to still manage all that yourself. And then there may be other life cycle. Like if you add a node back, um, you know, we, we won't then re you won't have the ability to reinstantiate like any hooks for that. So like it, there are some limitations there, but if you're already in, if you're already writing this JavaScript yourself, then if you need to run any life cycle related things. You could just run them, but there's, it could be done. It's gonna take a bit of work though for, for someone. So maybe just L, you a, have, oh, sorry, an, go ahead, Scott. Oh, just an example, like similar to that comment form that you helped me out with. Um, I've had people reach out saying that, you know, it was, you did a lot of work on that, but like understanding how the comments could be, you know, appended and, and worked with live view um, from other users. Uh, a similar example with this occlusion rendering and fin infinite loading example, uh, may be good enough is what you're saying just like a repo that we could talk about and publish and say you know here are some best practices yeah it could be i mean if if we had our own if we had our own javascript that we didn't want to maintain just like here's how it could work um 
that would be a nice start. I think it's eventually something that makes sense as an abstraction, but mm. it would take a lot of work to do. Like if you could just annotate your container as like, yes, I this is a Phoenix update append, and also, um, you know, whatever it's I don't know how this is referred to like occlusion, but if you could just give the number of items that you want. Uh, at yeah. any given time we just page those in and out for you um that would be awesome but yeah okay. like i said it, we, we we would need incentive to do it i think the fastest way is someone hire us with this use case and <laughs> and uh, <laughs> i will do it but i think yeah it's not something that i'm willing to take on right now but of course we would accept if someone wanted to contribute to it but yeah i think it makes sense as an abstraction it's just whether or not we have time to do it in the future yeah l um, maybe Scott knows this, but I'm just uh, wondering, is there a like a copy and write optimization, maybe only for web components of, you know, if, if we're having a giant list and you have like a base state, because like games will do this, of like the unmodified state of this element, UI element, you can copy it over and over again, and it's slightly more efficient to diff off of that than the way Morphtom is doing it, I don't think it's aware that like there are repeated elements of some base template. And I'm just wondering if that would help for giant lists. I, I certainly would. I mean, that's what um, we did occlusion rendering for the app I work on. And the uh, luckily it's baked into Glimmer. So uh, Glimmer JS, you know, you, you basically just tell it to uh, reuse and then it, it the speed improvements were, uh, you know, very, very noticeable. So uh, you're right. And, and you know, if that is a key uh, primitive that we would need to figure out, then, you know, certainly that would, that would help. Uh, actually, thinking back, this is still how uh, Java lists work, is that when you have a, a list cell renderer or table cell renderer, you're told not to think of that element as like being the table cell. That's a model in the background. The way you're told you think of a list cell render is like a stamp and it is stamping to like a texture. Well, now it'd be a texture because of 3D rendering, but it's stamping and like the graphics aren't really there. And I bet that's what Glimmer is doing is, it, is it's getting the browser to do that equivalent of the stamp. So like when you change the data inside of it, it's not thinking that you're updating the old one, but I'm not sure. Hmm. I have a uh, change in topic if anyone's interested in junior topics out of JavaScript stuff. Back to Elixir stuff. Um, and this is actually probably a question for L. Um, so L, did you see the bakeware stuff that was, uh, I know it's been kind of around for a bit, but I guess it officially oh, yeah. released. It's probably almost a year old because that was SpawnFest and SpawnFest is happening again. Yeah. Um, so yes, uh, the I mean, the big thing that shouts to me is the difference from, uh, Lumen is that the thing you put on disk is a single executable, but it's it's a self-unpacking tarball. So you need write permissions on disk, which isn't the same as how we were trying to compete with Go and Rust. Right. Is Bakeware going to have to include the entire like Beam VM in it, and it's going to be like a 20, yeah. 30 megabyte thing? Uh, yeah, because otherwise it wouldn't it wouldn't be single file. You'd have to have it sitting right. there, which obviously you could bake it that way. But while yes, it works. You have to assume it's at least on a system where you can go to temp. I don't know how flexible Bakeware was. It, it was a mm -hmm. spawn press project, which is you know sort of like the equivalent of a game jam, where like you're they're they're doing this project quickly, and then then Nerves like you know made it more official after the fact. Um, but as far as I know, it has to unpack. It is not smart enough to do an in-memory unpack because my current understanding of Beam is that it needs a real file system. And so, like right. you, you can have you could have an embed system, um, like on a phone switch that has a an RTOS, uh, but I don't think they do anymore because the OTP team just said that they were dropping like for some real time OSs they're dropping support for them, but like there needs to be some file system even if it's technically only in memory, so the OS has to be cooperative where like you can write to it for Bakeware to work, so there is that caveat. There yeah, are really ways. They're very OS specific to like unpack to memory and trick it to think it's an a uh, file system, but like Beam would need modifications to do that. So for those that don't know, that may be watching, um, Bakeware is essentially the one line is that just compile 
any, I think it's selling itself as Elixir application, but I assume it works for any beam based thing down to a single binary. Um, and it, it trended on Hacker News, I think sometime in the past week, uh, pretty high. And there seemed to be a lot of excitement in the thread about it. And I was reading it and I, I guess I missed the original announcement about it, but I went back and looked at it and saw that it had been around did it come out of SpawnFest? Like it was a result of someone spiking it at SpawnFest? Yeah, that was my understanding is that because the Bakeware team like won a category or something for SpawnFest. So my understanding was that yeah. it was either debuted at SpawnFest or was like mm -hmm. game jam style completely developed during SpawnFest. Right. So my, my immediate thought was like, oh, this seems like we're trying to accomplish some of what they're doing um, or doing with Lumen. Our approach is radically different, but I think that from an end user's point of view, they would probably consider it to be similar if they're doing command line stuff. Yeah, v very similar. Um, I mean, the argument can kind of be made the same for like eScripts though. Like it's almost right. the same. It's it's how much you're allowed to write and like whether it really has to be a single executable. Um, mm -hmm. If this sort of like part way solution is probably easier before everyone started do, doing containers because you're likely to cut off write access except for like specific log directories that you redirect. Because then it was easier because like uh, at Rapid7, our installer on Linux for Metasploit Pro was sort of what BigWare is doing. It is a bash script and bash scripts can just have a data section and all of a sudden you're like, you, you have bash shell script and then all of a sudden it's just binary garbage after a certain point. And that's what it's doing. And so you can, that's how you can have a self extracting tarball is it's actually a shell script that reads the end of itself to get the actual tar part out and execute and then like mm -hmm. unpack it normally. Um, I have a quick poll for everyone. How many people plan on attending in person ElixirConf? The, the one in Austin, right? Yeah. Yep. So about maybe four of us. Um, yeah, so I think it's supposed to be two days in person, two days virtual. If I remember what the tweet said. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I plan on going, um, but I also expect it to probably be a hundred people in person. Maybe I, I hope it's more, but I, I yeah, imagine we don't know, gonna be a lot we don't know what to expect. Uh, it's going to be back at Norris, the, where we started. So back to our right roots. next to the ice rink. Exactly. Uh, oh, it'll be yeah. great. We'll have power on every table and awesome internet. That's true. So it's always that. actually been a good time there. Yeah, I don't. I was talking with Jim, the organizer, and yeah, I, I don't think you know. We hope to get a lot of people there, um, but it's hard to say. Like, yeah, what what folks' comfort level is going to be? Um, yeah, or like travel budget. Like, you know, companies that are sending developers. Like, you know, who knows? So I expect to. Uh, I I think it will be reasonably attended, uh, just because I know I'm anxious to go in person somewhere get out of the and, house and see people yeah so i'm hopeful that enough of, uh, enough people in which the community feel the same but uh, i'll be there so it's, looking forward to it has anyone had any local meetups start up again in person no no nothing here either i'm, I'm kind of curious because i LixerConf is the first conference that I know of, even though it's not scheduled out until October, but I actually have not heard of any other conferences that have said they're going to do an in-person conference this year. And so to kind of, I'm, I'm trying to find something that's leading into it saying like, oh, meetups are starting to happen again. There's this event that's in person. Um, and yeah, it seems like there'll be decent attendance at LixerConf, but it, it seems like it may just be like virtual, 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 boom, ElixirConf. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think. I, sorry, I was gonna say, I, I think a lot of the reason we're not we're not seeing a lot of venues or conferences announced is, I think it's not so much that people don't feel it will be safe in October. Uh, organizers, I think there's just a, a huge amount of risk at the organi yeah, organizer level. Yeah, of course. Where, like, you know, for people that are watching, like, I didn't know this till I got involved with conferences. Um, like, I didn't know how much risk was on the table for the organizer. It's like tons you have, yeah uh, unbelievable because everything's many, paid many for hundreds of thousands of dollars right for yeah. even yeah even small conferences because yeah you all the yeah brian can speak to this because he's run conferences but yeah you have to print all the money up front and then hope people attend and hope people 
like all the hotel rooms at the conference hotel have to be bought and then you hope that people actually come in and stay and at then the you hotel. have to fight the venue on certain things yeah, so Brian, then you have sure to put has... up with people complaining about ticket prices i mean it is it is a punishing uh experience running a conference yeah so i think that's my, if i had a hunch that's what we're seeing is organizers are you know just unsure how many people are going to would attend this year and then also if there's like a triple mutant variant uh, that happens and things shut down again uh, then they're on the hook for you know the entire uh, amount that they put up so that's what i'm assuming is happening with why conferences aren't being announced versus right. elixir comp being like you know uh, super early l i mean the big one for me is like the the kids will finally get vaccinated uh, around then but it's iffy whether they'll be full sequence and i'm not sure if i feel comfortable with like a full flight and seeing everyone um well you in particular because you have mm, yeah you know, I, I mean is that even an issue for for me probably fine it'll be you know i got vaccinated like a month ago so like maybe i mean right now the more virus like ones like one of the one of the chinese ones that use um and a the adenovirus, so like, you know, one of the other viruses that gives us colds besides coronaviruses, that one needs a booster already. So like, it could be booster time, potentially, um, but I got Pfizer, so I, I have confidence that way. It's mostly like the risk of bringing it back to the house. Um, but yeah, th there could be more. Right now, the variants seem covered. Um, uh, I listened to all of the This Week in Virology podcast, so I'm very up to date on everything. So it's not that way. It's, it's mostly just uh, bringing it back back to my kid. Um, and then, then the other way would be, um, yeah, just if other people don't want to come, it's it's a huge risk for for conference organizers. I, yeah, it, it's a big risk. Plus, people might be like, "Well, we did this last year with virtual conferences. Why do we have to pay for this now?" Oh, I can tell you why. Because uh, oh, no, I understand about virtual conferences <laughs> suck, year. and they are not as good. Like, I actually I, liked. You know what? I liked last year's because what I really liked was the. Um, uh, like there were hallway track Zoom Zoom meetings or whatever. I don't know. If, I don't recall if we use Zoom or not for ElixirCon, but I actually kind of like that because I would. I like. I jumped into the Pepsi one. I jumped into the Erlang Solutions one, and I was uh, just bouncing around. And I found that fun. Um, I like the the complaints I saw were primarily around the video releasing, and I thought that those complaints were complete and utter. I'm going to swear here, but fucking bullshit. <laughs> so those people can screw off. And that's going out on the YouTube video. I'm saying it definitively. Um, the uh, what, as long as we're talking about conferences, I should probably bring up there's the Elixir Wizards con conference, which I think is in a few days. And there's probably still tickets available. You know, if people want to want to see that. Um, I are there any other Elixir conferences between now and ElixirConf? There's a in Europe ElixirConf EU in Warsaw is in September. In person. Okay. And I would, yeah, I usually make it to both EU, US, but yeah, with a, with an infant, I'm not going to be able to do a yeah. September, October conference trek. So I'll be at the US one. Okay. Uh, any more topics of conversation? Uh, do we want to, uh, there's a couple of things from the Keith Lee blog post that I thought were sure. uh, maybe worth talking about. Um, and I don't generally have super strong opinions on these kinds of things. Like, um, like we, we talked about this on our project a little bit. For me, a lot of kind of style choices are just like, uh, you know, I, I could go either way. <laughs> um, the only thing that, that I get kind of particular about is when it affects the runtime behavior of the system. And so a couple of things he was talking about were about when do you <coughs> return an error tuple versus when do you raise? And like, for example, raise exceptions if you receive invalid data, um, only return error tuples when the caller can do something about it. And I don't really necessarily disagree with those, but I think I think maybe the way I would look at it is um, when you return an error tuple, you're letting the caller decide if they care about that error. And so you, the question is like, what part of the system needs to make that decision? So if you're writing a library, you pretty much never should raise unless it's a method, I mean, a method, <laughs> unless it's a function with a bang, 
to say like, I will raise if something goes wrong here. So file dot write bang. You know, when I call that, I know I'm going to get a specific error for file writing as opposed to like a match error on the OK tuple. And so I want to add. I want to add to the list of things that libraries should never do, which is log. <laughs> yes, I, yeah. There's there's the um, uh, what it's actually really really well written uh, HTTP like uh, underneath library that some of the Elixir core team members wrote. Um, does anyone remember the name of it? It's uh, like a, a lot of other is libraries. Mint? Can, yes, Mint. So or is Mint the one that Peter Gamash wrote? Like Peter Gamash is consuming. It's Mint. Yeah, okay, so Mint. I think Mint logs in there, and you can kind of turn off, but it's a, more of like a greedy turn off. You have to turn off that level of logging for everything. And it should, I find that I like, these are like, this is my, my weird kind of like style side, like things when it comes to code. Nothing, like it could be the best library in the world, but if it's gonna annoy the hell out of me in my console logger, like I'll just, I'll eject it. And that was, you know, the, I really wish, I don't know, I haven't seen it in a while, so maybe they have changed it. I, I may have even opened an issue about it, but I, I really don't think that um, libraries you're consuming should log uh, and start like spamming your logger unless you're opting into it. I agree with that so much. We have a huge uh, problem with that on our project with logs yeah. coming from somewhere in the RabbitMQ stack. And I, it's like, it's on my list to chase it down because it's making it yeah. impossible to get anything useful out of our logs. Well, uh, on the same project, like it's security related. So we're using libraries in ways that in theory are trying to break us. So they're trying to log us telling us broken, but it's actually, we expect that. So we have to suppress the logs. It was going through all the Erlang stuff to try to figure out how to suppress the logs, which is really, so haphazard and it'd just be so much nicer to be like no it's okay just shut up right yeah yeah like uh uh we failed to connect to this database like well i wanted you to fail to connect to that database because if you could <laughs> it was vulnerable <laughs> so cool keep failing um but yeah i i don't know if this would be workable but could could telemetry be a complete replacement for logging, and that way you could just opt in and log the things you care about? Maybe? I think telemetry is supposed to be faster and more machine parsable, so you wouldn't be able to get human-readable log messages over it. But but just on principle, I think. I don't know if you're disallowed from sending strings over it. Well, at the least, you can make, you know, your library more configurable to depending upon what you want to log or how you want to log it. I mean, I think that's nice, but yeah, there's always suppressing logs if you can figure out what specifically to suppress. That's always yeah. a trick. You're I'm stuck on sort of pattern matching that specific log message that you don't want to see, which is pretty tedious and yeah. maybe. Yeah. It, this may be me just not remembering correctly about how like Erlang's logger works, but in my head, I felt like at one point that I recall you can log you you could set up a logger per application, but then I feel like that's not actually the case. It's just like you get one logger for your entire runtime. It'd be really nice if you could have a logger per application, and then like you could like in your mix config, you could say you know for this given application name, we're gonna suppress the logs for all levels for that application. Um, that would solve a lot of that type of issues because then I could just say mint like logger false or whatever, and like I, I feel like I'm talking over two different parts here, and I may be not remembering correctly how the logger works. If someone does, just you know, say no, you're that's, wrong about this. That's somewhat what I did, but there wasn't a way to tell it to be quiet. There was a yeah. there. There's like a nope. even more than like how we're used to like the Elixir logger config metadata. Like the Erlang level one has way more metadata, like exactly where it's called, what application there is. And it's like it's like this okay. deep, deeply nested structure. And so you can filter all that stuff out because it is actually much more structured in like a tuple of tuples of maps of lists and stuff like that. And with that, you can filter out it being in a specific application. But the Elixir, that's at the Erlang inter interface for it, not the um, Elixir one. But since when we when I was doing this, it was right when the Elixir version where like the OTP, Elixir just used OTP's logger and it didn't have its own version of logger anymore, it was, that saved us. Because if they were separate, it would have been a pain in the butt. I mean, it was still a pain in the butt, but like, 
less so yeah. than having to have two types of filtering. I got us off the topic. Sorry, Nathan. We were talking about blog posts. I... Yeah, no worries. Um, one other thing in, that was in the post that I liked, I'll, I'm not I, I, I'm not totally in agreement that this is the way to do it, but uh, he has a section, Keith Lee has a section in here called avoid else and with blocks. I, I'm not, I wouldn't say that, always do that. I like having the avoiding, else with block. So avoiding the else inside the with block? Yeah, he shows he shows like a before and after, and I do like his after example. I like the way that he, uh, the the alternate solution he has, but I think what I like about the with block is that all the happy path stuff is up together, and mm -hmm. then you can have several else below that deal with you know whatever edge cases you might run into, and I think that that helps the readability even if you have a bunch of else cases. But um, he did have a cool trick, which was like basically each. Each function you're calling in your with statement is going to return, uh, if anything goes wrong, it's going to return an error and then a specific error, um, like an exception data structure. And you'll fall out of the with for any of those. And he said, like, because you're always returning one of those exception type data structures, then the, then the caller can actually just turn around and raise that if they want to. OK, so um, I think I see the example. Like, he is. Um, he basically has like a function handler in between and it will just pattern match based upon the result of the width. Is that the one you're talking about in the blog post? Yeah, it's it's like the last example in that section on, on avoid else and with blocks. He's got, at the very bottom, you see the decode function and he's doing, um, if, oh, the yeah, decode, yeah. if the decode fails, he's gonna return this Error tuple with an error dot internal, which is this like error, uh, exception structure he's building, mm. and like no matter what goes wrong, he's going to build one of those exception structures. I think is the idea. I think that's kind of a cool idea, and the with block looks really clean. Um, but then, just the the logic for basically the logic for what do I do in the case of this error, and then what I do in the case of that error is actually elsewhere in the caller and in a case statement or something. So I wouldn't say always do that, but I kind of I thought it was interesting. Hmm. I mean, I maybe I can understand this if the scale of a width block gets really large. Like this like example here, the example itself may be too contrived to really for me to kind of get on board with making that change. But if you had like a width block with a say something nuts with like 10, 15 statements in it and especially a very complex else statement maybe i i guess i would have to understand like where you know what was the very specific use case that chris saw that you know he deviated from wanting to use else yeah i, I agree that's it, it's a lot of it seems like a lot of complexity in there to uh, for anything other than what would be a large really large with statement. Um, I also, the the, de the decode call at the bottom of that example, um, to me, uh, the, the kind of using with statements in the on the inverse and, and expecting the error is is hard to read and hard to, to understand if you jump into that. So I had to sit there and, and try to figure out like what, what does it actually mean is going on here. So it's, it's just, to me, to me, I, I, I uh, that's one of the ones I didn't agree with, uh, I think. A good good else blocks that that cleanly lay out what you're what you're expecting to happen um, on those paths, and then cleaning them up to to be a, a unified error return. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I could see these being as really good rules for within an organization to basically communicate intent and keeping things norm things normalized. You know, like our organization has this style guide and. You know, here are some of the the programming models that we employ for the style guide. Um, in that way, everyone's kind of speaking the same language as far as their uh, their code quality goes. Um, but yeah, I agree with uh, I agree with Mike on on the with L stuff. Scott, you, you had a hand up. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just kind of here nodding because I generally yeah I feel the same. Um, and I think yeah, Mike was bringing up a good point of like. Well, you look at this example, and there's quite a bit more code for just something that could be a simple else block. And 
I think these are all interesting considerations. And yeah, as Brian pointed out, a style guy could help. But yeah, I mean, if you if you have a a code base where someone kind of throws this in there, it's sort of a it's a different take. Um, I think all these examples are valid to some degree, um, but would you want to come across this in in your app? Kind of a kind of a different error handling pattern like that, uh, and then in some cases you go a completely different route. Uh, so I think that's kind of a, a bigger question in my mind is what what do you do when you come across something like this, say in a PR? Is this is this something you go, oh, looks great, let's adopt this, or do you, you know, kind of push back and say, well, is this more than what we want to do? Not to say it's wrong or or worse or anything. I I mean, for me, I'd have to be exposed to the problem side of it before I'd be wanting to. To take this on like i'd have to say okay you know we keep having a problem with this you know this block of code here or these types of blocks of code here's our solution um if this was introduced on a new project where we haven't run into those issues yet and i don't personally have experience with having to solve it in this particular way i would probably be hesitant to uh, accept it um I would say, like, until we were together on the project, Nathan, I don't use else because I predate with, and with is there to combine um, case statements in my mind. And so the whole point is to write less code. And so the point of the with was you take the happy path, and maybe if you're a little bit weird, you take the error path, which I, I agree with Mike, like, sometimes it's hard to follow. It's sort of like doing an inverted condition, like a not instead of a true value for an if in other languages that the error case just falls out. And that's sort of why widths are dangerous of that, like if you accidentally fall out with something that isn't a true error, it's just a silent bug. The other thing with else is like, if you else and every single pattern is for a, a specific one of your lines and there's no common pattern, I think that's actually way hard to understand because it's very hard to know that one of your error cases is actually a used line of code because you separate it so far from the thing producing it that it's hard to keep track of. If you're combining more than one error case together in a pattern, sure, that reduces your amount of code. But otherwise, I don't really like else. Yeah, I, I, that's a good point because I definitely know that I forced else, sorry, I forced with into my code at times after it was introduced uh, into Elixir when I could have probably just used a case statement and called it a day. Um, I do think that there are times where it has worked out nicely, but there's definitely times where um, just because it was new and shiny, I feel like I had to use it. But my credo config yeah. told me I couldn't nest yeah. any more case yeah. statements. <laughs> yeah. So what that actually, um, the, there are two rules in credo that actually, I've, in following those, I've, I've kind of cleaned up my uses of whip, and it's the 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 if a with statement starts or ends with a an unfailable uh, entry, it should be either before the with statement or, or inside the with statement. So if it's you know if it's a, if the left hand side is just a variable, um, th that can't fail. So so if it's at the top or bottom, pull it out and you keep doing that. And if you re if you end up with a single item in a with case with statement, make it a case statement because it's just it just it's just cleaner and uh, easier to read. Um, I would delete that credo error from any project I was on, but. <laughs> I don't disagree. What? I don't disagree with the premise that it could be clear, but oh. as a matter oh. of rule, if, if a width had an individual, a single line, I disagree that it should just be rewritten as a case. Like the Phoenix generators for like uh, APIs will generate widths yeah. in the controller for the happy path. Yeah. And like, I have a, goal I, is like you could, I, you I agree with that one. Steps. Yeah. So, I have an interesting anyway, question. I, so I, yeah. It's a good premise, but as a rule where Credo yells at me when I'm like, no, I want a with here, I would rage quit that that rule. But I don't what, disagree but, that it could be clear in certain cases. What idiomatic best practices in Elixir does the Phoenix project reject? <laughs> so we know that there's no specs. We know um, that, you I guess now the Credo rule. Yeah, like like what what stuff over the okay. years has been introduced uh, to Elixir? Chris is okay. like, no, the, the hill that I'll die on. I think, 
<laughs> Credo changed this because Jose and I asked so many times. I could be wrong. Uh, Mike can correct me. Um, the uh, creating a variable binding inside an if Phoenix all Phoenix projects failed and based the the default Credo check for years because we like one of the helper files we generated had like an if. I think it was like if uh, notice equals git flash notice or something. You know, we assigned the variable binding and uh, that was like a big no-no. But to me, that's absolutely fine. Uh, I hate that from other languages before. So yeah. I'm like, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Exactly. It, it come, Yeah, it comes from other languages. But yeah, for us, it's, yeah. So just inside the if, you just say like if result equals whatever. And if that's truthy, it will execute. I will do that all day long. And every Phoenix, Phoenix project does that. So I've, I've never run into that. Uh, so I don't know if that's okay. They must have changed it. But for years, Credo was uh, very against that. And people would I... like open an issue and we'd be like, nope, we're not changing the generators. I also though, don't like the fact that Elixir is falsy. And I will use case over if most of the time for Booleans because I want to be very specific that I didn't accidentally fuck up like a, a function I'm calling and it doesn't actually return Boolean. Yeah. Yeah, I go back and forth. Uh, actually, yesterday I did a case on, it could have been if, if else, and I did a case with a nil match. Um, but I would say I actually err on the side of if uh, in those cases, but I used a case specifically because I, I cared about, like, it needed to be nil. Uh, it was like if someone would, was passing a value in, and, like, if they had passed something not nil, then it was a, a user error. But it may be more like a library level of concern. Cool. All right. What, oh. One other thing that was in this post that I uh, I thought was cool is just the the very last example is um, don't do a something like assert enum dot all posts. Uh, the post is a post struct. Do four post in posts assert that this one is a post struct so that you if it fails you get the specific item that failed. And just in general, thinking about in a test, if this fails, how will I get the clearest possible failure and know how to fix it is a nice a nice thing to consider. I do like some, I, I think JUnit or maybe one of the other ones in Java has a contains all and it will then diff the difference, which is nice. It'd be nice if the diffing part that, that um, XUnit has worked better for those cases where like it contains, but I don't give a shit about the order. Like that's usually the reason why you have to do the four is because you actually don't care about the order, but you don't want to like put in a set because the diff thing doesn't work with sets because they're actually maps. Um, that would be a nice thing if XUnit supported because I agree you end up have you have to do the four so that you get the asserts correctly. And then one thing I wanted to mention, I guess, constructive criticism for. Chris's post. Um, and the thing is, Chris and I agree, I think, on a lot of um, contentious issues. Um, but I, I will say that I think, like, this post has, um, I, I think, went viral. It was like number one on Hacker News. And I think the framing of it is why it's caused like a lot of arguments. Like, people have, like, I disagree with this. I think is framing it as good and bad elixir, I think, was a mistake. Um, there's actually there's a ton of neat um, suggestions he has. Um, but I think, like, good and bad elixir like if you pipe the case you're not a bad like it's not bad elixir so i think like the assert one absolutely was like a, a neat trick that um like there so there were some things I, I i did internalize and actually like the using access versus like keyword or map get i've been playing with that uh in some live view code i've been using um i actually changed it back to not use access but it, anyway his post did make me think and um there were some neat things there but i think like good versus bad and the way it was framed here is actually like here's some things that he's learned that he thinks is a little bit better because like we've as a consultancy like we've absolutely seen bad elixir code and it's like it's not piping to a case statement so i think that that's one reason the post has been more contentious than i think than necessary it's like how to write effective elixir not how like you're not a bad elixir you're not bad at elixir if you pipe the case or use an else with with yeah, but does it make it to number one on Hacker News if it doesn't have exactly. the... Uh, Probably not. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, that's it that's right. You yeah. want to go viral, right. you can't write a few tips you might find that's useful. Right. In oh, yeah. Nothing <laughs> Nothing gets people to click on your article more than pissing them off, right? <laughs> Is my elixir bad? Let me see. 
and all the comments too, right? Yeah, if someone wouldn't have all those, I, I disagree with this exclamation point, like that wouldn't have happened and wouldn't have driven the discussion. So yeah. my, my next blog post is going to be, if you do this in Elixir, you're an idiot. There you go. I think that one of the, you know, Brian, Brian I think may have mentioned this earlier, but the, um, the one of the, what would be cool is, is more information on why he's, the, the bad code that he's seen that caused that. So like, for example, the, Pipe into a pipe into a case statement. He says, "I've seen this abused." I, I was actually interested to see how you know what what sort of the what the anti patterns he was trying to push it back on. Uh, that would be uh, helpful to me because I, I I do pipe in a case and I, I don't, yeah I do uh, I, I do don't too. Have a problem with that. So, so um, to see but to to know what the you know here I I can kind of picture some ways to do really really horrible things with that that I think the new is it um, then. Uh, Stuff in one twelve will will make easier, but yeah, more, so, more information on why would be cool. I, I I don't know if this was Chris's intent for this section, but I have I've I'm guilty of this, and I have seen a lot of people. I think this is more prevalent in people that are new to Elixir and are learning it. They tend to force themselves into pipe composability than is really necessary at times. Like they're like, oh wow, I can have this like. 30 statement pipe. If I just munge everything properly, um, it'll work. And I think that the, the the syntax sugar of the pipe is alluring at times and it should be resisted sometimes. Like it's good to have, but it shouldn't be like, you should everything shouldn't be pipeable. Yeah, I think yeah, the I longer think... I do Elixir, the less pipes I use. But like, to be clear, pipe, Elixir pipes are amazing. And I use them, but I do agree with that, Brian. I, I find myself like less like less of a yearning to be like, oh, yeah. I have to make this one more thing pipeable because everything else well, is in pipelines. Like, the the um, variable recently in use it. version of, of Elixir, it addressed this because for a while back when we had the Elixir Google group, that may still exist. I don't know. But the like early on in Elixir, even probably pre 1.0. There was always like it was a surefire bet. Someone would come in like maybe one, once a month and ask how they can pipe into like the second or third argument of a function because they wanted to continue the pipes. And now there is the um, is it tap? Is that the function that you can kind of do that? Is there's uh, like it would be then. Mm, I mean, tap you can just a turn. Yeah, then. Yeah, that's just then? tap okay. is for like yeah. you want to. Something. Yeah. yeah, I just read the changelog very quickly, but I, I saw like, okay, it seems like this function can now satisfy that concern, and now we can just pipe everything. Yeah, and that that so he kind of hit, hits on. So when I start, I started in, in one o, and it was you know pipe. You know, as soon as you learn about the pipe, you're like, okay, everything's gonna be a pipe. This is awesome, and and you know, I'm gonna jam everything into being a pipe, and then you realize why that's you know a bad idea. Um, and I think you know, there, I remember there was a there was a blog post pre one three. The, about this and that ended up, that's where the with statement came from and, and mm -hmm. my understanding of the with statement was it was specifically for that reason like the and he, he touches on i think on the second or third point about you know don't have your subsequent functions take the okay or error tuple and then you know like that was a that was a that was an anti-pattern to to maintain the pipe and so mm -hmm. the with statement so what i generally i started as a, as a pipe and if it starts if if i run into something like that it's like okay can i actually convert this into a with statement and and keep it clean that way and you know so that that's how, that's generally yeah. how i program I, I just want to put out kind of like to those that are watching that um i don't want to discourage the use of pipe and i think thinking about things in a composable nature is good like modeling for your program but it's like whenever you're using one thing all the time that's probably a smell that you're using it too much I especially usually, if you're forcing code down that path i usually balance out the piping by thinking that modules even though they're not classes, probably should agree on what like their data, their first, their, their subject is of like, you know, like enum exists to work on enum. So the enum should be the first argument because that's why they exist to counteract the problem that Erling kept switching the position of arguments. Yeah. So I, um, I guess I'll bring it full circle. Uh, there has been for a while a ECMAScript uh, proposal. And I think that Babel allows you to opt into this to add pipes in the JavaScript. So we won't we won't talk about it, but I guess we can just end on thinking about how much pipes will be abused in JavaScript world and how many libraries will be rewritten as pipes uh, if that ever actually makes it into uh, into the language. 
And hopefully they'll have a slant pipe that creates a closure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we were joking we just, about. Phoenix just used its first, uh, there's a pro the promise uh, API in JavaScript is now in use in Phoenix and it's 2021. So if, if pipeline lands, it'll give me 10 years. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've avoided any new features in my own JavaScript, uh, that aren't just like syntactic niceties. So, oh, of course, I guess we can brace it, uh, very briefly bring up the, the one breaking, well, one of the breaking changes is that it's dropping IE 11 support and uh -oh. yeah, yeah. So we're dropping Babel from, from the JavaScript stuff because. Well, you Microsoft know, what the hell? You shouldn't be like, using IE 11 anymore. Yeah, <laughs> like, let's actually, get Phoenix serious. JS, Phoenix JS has like an IE 6 line. So we, we can drive that. I saw that. For <laughs> yeah. Ajax. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're detecting if a a, 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 con, a, a class or... ActiveX, you know, something or other. Yeah. yeah, so we can kill that too, I, I suppose. But yeah, IE 11, we supported it, but it's for people that are watching, they're like, I just bet my business and I on this and I have to have IE 11 support. Like uh, you can configure webpack to do the incantations yep. that will build the project with the polyfills right and do ie 11 so like you'll, you like there it can be made to work we're just not going to ship that out of the box for the you know 0.5 percent of users that need it that's yep so that's the that's what's going on i i should probably really do a before and after like footprint size on what the babel less uh js file size is but It'll be less. All right, and we need to wrap up. Um, no, we're going. We're going another hour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everyone, everyone, stopped watching by this point. Uh, thanks, everybody. This was fun, uh, and uh, I'll we'll do it again soon. Bye. Thanks. Yep.